please turn in your Bibles to Luke 22, Luke 22, and uh, bring out, uh, pull out your message outline, Luke 22, and we're looking at uh, verses, really, verses sort of 7 through 13, and uh, if you're here last week, uh, you'll know that we began this chapter, and uh, where we are, just to orientate you, um, we are now on the sort of countdown to the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, Now, it might seem that we've been on a long countdown to the uh, crucifixion, and there still will be a bit more of a countdown to that. Um, But it's good. We're looking at these sorts of things as we're leading up to the death of Christ. And we need to understand, as I was saying last week, but certainly I'll mention it again today, is that the death of Christ was no accident. It was not a bad ending to a, a noble effort by a good man. In fact, Jesus' death on the cross was not the ending of his story. It was really the beginning of our salvation. The death of Jesus was not even the end of his life. It was the goal of his life and the beginning of our eternal lives. So when the Romans nailed Jesus to the cross on Friday afternoon, Christ had won already. He had won the victory over sin and Satan and death and hell and had provided salvation for his people. In fact, his whole life on earth lived, that he lived was in anticipation of his death on the cross. In fact, he said in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he came to die. That was the reason why he was here on this earth. He came to offer himself as the only sacrifice for sin that could satisfy the wrath of God. So his death is the only payment for sin by which God can forgive sinners. And all scripture points to his death. So, as you go right back to the beginning of time from Adam and Eve, we are taught that a sacrificial death of an innocent provides covering for the guilty. From Abel, we are taught that death, a sacrificial death, uh, is the only way to please God. From Abraham, we are taught that the proper sacrifice must be provided by God himself. From the Passover, we are taught that the sacrifice must be an unblemished sacrifice. And from the centrality of all the sacrifices in the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament, we are taught that there has never been a final satisfactory sacrifice. And that's why they would go on, year on, year on, year on, a sacrifice until the sacrifice of God's Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus came to die to be God's sacrifice. And with the death of Jesus, God is satisfied that a perfect sacrifice has been offered on behalf of those, all those who will believe. God pours out his wrath on Christ, his wrath, his justice is satisfied, and he grants to those who put their trust in him forgiveness and salvation. And the view of the unbelieving and seemingly relentless critics that Jesus died an unexpected death is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, I I don't know how much you read, but the stuff that I read, time and time again, you you see these new ideas about the the, the death of Christ. He was just a victim. No, he wasn't. I'll show you as we go through it tonight. Because all of the Old Testament pointed towards his death. All the events of his life pointed towards his death. He repeatedly promised that he would die and that he would rise again on the third day. He planned every detail of his life to 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 unfold in perfect agreement with the will of his Father. So he was on a divine schedule and he controlled every detail. Now that becomes clear as we watch the unfolding events in the hours before his death. I think you see that quite clearly. Some might say that the Jewish leaders or Satan or or, or Judas were in charge of the events. The fact is is that Jesus was in charge of absolutely everything and and we'll see that this evening. In fact, he said himself in John 10, 17 to 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And when he came to the end of his suffering on the cross, he died by his own will. And the soldiers, well, they were stunned that he was dead so early. They didn't expect him to die that quick, did they? But he had to die on a specific day at a specific time, and he controlled that. He controlled everything else, even though all the players, all the people in this drama thought that they were acting with a degree of independence. No one really does because everything is under God's sovereign control. So here in our passage this evening, we're going to see really how God works out his plans. And there are two elements that I want us to look at this this evening. The first is this, the people who are part of God's plan. 
Now, last week, we looked at some of them. We looked at some of the, the people, uh, and we're going to look at a few others as well, but I want to remind you of some of them is because they, they play into uh, the rest of the, the, this chapter. Remember, we began last week by looking at the, what I called the, the devious religious leaders. We saw that in verse 2. And they thought, even though they thought that they were religious, very religious, because they perceived themselves as being devout, and they'd convinced the population of Israel that they were devout, they play a role in what God will accomplish through Christ on the cross. Then we also, we looked at the devil, didn't we? We talked about his role, verse 3, in entering Judas. And then we came to the traitor, Judas himself, one of the twelve, who is the betrayer of the Lord Jesus. So God is orchestrating everything, and yet within the providences and the purposes of God, and completely under his control, the chief priests are acting on their own wicked will. The devil is acting on his own perverted, depraved, and totally corrupt will, and Judas is acting on his own perverse, rebellious will. All of them controlled by God to achieve God's ends. And many times during his ministry, Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. And he didn't allow himself to be arrested, taken prisoner and killed, even though the leaders of Israel had long wanted to do that. But now, now he begins to speak differently. Because this final week of his life, he begins to say, my hour has come. In fact, in Matthew 26, 18, the parallel passage to this, he says, my appointed time is near. This is the time. This is the time for which I was born. This is now my time. And all the elements and the people go into motion and they're all moving in preparation for the cross to accomplish the purposes of God. Now, I don't know about you, but on the surface, as you read this chapter, God is hidden. God is invisible, isn't he? But actually, he's behind everything, moving everything into how he wants it. Isaiah 53, verse 10 says, yet as we heard this earlier on this evening, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It is the Lord God who is behind the death of Jesus Christ. It is his plan and his purpose with which Christ is in perfect agreement. God is the one who wanted Jesus dead. Jesus voluntarily agreed to do the will of the Father and for the joy that was set before him in providing redemption for sinners and with whom he would fellowship forever in glory. So as we, we enter chapter 22, the, the divine plan, the divine schedule starts to move. Verses 1 to 6 begin to take place and they occur on the Wednesday night. And starting in verse 7, we move to Thursday. And Thursday is the day when preparation has to be made for the Passover meal that evening. And Friday, as we know, will be his crucifixion. Now, the plan of God is very simple. On Friday afternoon, between 3 and 6, whenever sunset occurs, the Passover lambs will be slaughtered. Tens of thousands of them will be slaughtered in a period of time that, in fact, Exodus 12 sort of prescribes as between the two evenings. It is that period of time between three and sunset, that is when Jesus will die. He will die during that time because he will die in perfect accord with the Passover sacrifice because he is, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he is our Passover. His death will be precisely at the time when the Passover lambs are being slaughtered and he will be the only one to provide the real final sacrifice. Now, remember, the religious leaders want him dead, don't they? Verse 2, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. They were seeking how they themselves might put him to death, but not at Passover, because they were afraid the people would riot because Jesus was very popular. I mean, he was the greatest show in town, wasn't he? They overestimate the people's commitment, so what they decide to do, they want to take him secretly, undercover, quietly away from the crowd, in the dark, in a private room somewhere where no one else would know. And then they would hold him until the Passover was over, and then when the people had sort of dispersed, and, uh, and then they could then have him executed. That, that was their plan. They wanted to take him as soon as they could and hold him because the next day they could allow him, they couldn't allow him to have more contact with the people and then another opportunity to, to turn them away from the religion of Judaism and perhaps even generate this, this anti-Roman re rebellion, in which case this would cause them problems in their positions of power. So they want to arrest him as soon as they possibly can. And remember also, as we saw last week, they had met in the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, with the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the people. 
all these leaders coming together, trying to figure out how they're going to get Jesus. We've got to get him out of the public eye. They have no idea that he's going to die on Friday. So they want to get hold of him. They want to get him, hold him until all the people are gone, and then they can do what they need to do. But how? They want him dead now. They're committed to that. Now, don't forget, the devil, he too wants him arrested, but the devil doesn't want him dead. We saw that last week. The devil wanted Jesus arrested because the devil wanted a riot, assuming that the people had a commitment to Jesus. They would riot against the, the attempt of the Jewish leaders to take his life, and he would then not die, and therefore the devil would then prevent him from the cross. And by the way, the devil will have an, another go at that a little bit later on when Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks' time. So the devil, what he would do is he would ramp up the temptation. He would ramp up the temptation to a fierce level in the hours to come to try to stop Jesus going to the cross just by the sheer anticipation of its horrors. But neither the religious leaders or the devil know the future, do they? Judas, what did he want? Well, he wanted money. There's nothing said about whether he cared if Jesus lived or died, but he wanted money, and he wanted it as fast as he could get it, and he wanted it out sooner rather than later. And his treachery was devil-induced as Satan entered into Jesus. Verse 3 tells us that. This plays right into the hands wonderfully, doesn't it? All the Jewish leaders are meeting at the house of Caiaphas. They're talking about how do we get rid of Jesus? What are we going to do? What are we gonna, what's, how are we going to do this? And then who guess, guess who shows up at the meeting? Judas. He comes to the meeting and he says, hey, what's it worth to you? How much are you going to pay me? And he negotiates 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave, about four months' wages, and he says, I'll sell him to you for that. Because they could never find him at night unless they had an informant on the inside. They didn't have to look for one. One showed up. So Judas struck his deal with the leaders in the secret meeting, and then they looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus. A time when Jesus would be isolated, a time when he would be away from the crowd, a time when nobody would be around. So as Thursday comes around, Judas knows the night they're going to have a Passover meal together because, verse 7, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Well, this is perfect. Judas must have thought to himself because the Passover would be held in a small room in a house, kind of a sort of a guest room where 13 people could fit in, the, the, the 12 and Jesus. So that would mean... That would mean it was at the time when the Passover was being celebrated around the city. People would not be in the streets. It was night. They would be indoors, either celebrating the Passover or preparing to celebrate the Passover. This is perfect. No crowds. No crowds will be around. We'll get him there. And Judas probably regarded this as the best possible option. No crowds, a private room, only the 12, fixed specific location, Easy to tell the Jewish leaders exactly where they're going to be, but here's the thing. And the reason why I've taken the time to get to where I'm getting to is this. Jesus knows all of that. And he knows what Satan wants. And he knows what Judas is thinking. So he thwarts that plan in verses 7 to 13. That's what's going on here. And here is one other group that are part of God's plan, and that's the disciples particularly Peter and John, actually. They play a very important role, which is going to happen. And what we read in verses 7 through 13 is a picture how Jesus set up a Passover meal at a place that no one knew. No names are given, no locations are given, are they? Verse 10, Jesus says, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? In other words, he says, look, go into the city and follow a man carrying a, a water jug. Go to the house of a man whose name is not given. Uh, do not identify you represent me. Just say the teacher. And the unnamed man and the unnamed man carrying the water jug will give you the guest room. And, and that's where you'll have the Passover. Now, if Jesus had said, look, go to Mr. So-and-so and uh, he will take you to the owner of the house who is a certain man and his house is on such and such a street and at such and such a location, guess who would have known all about that? Judas. Judas would have heard that, and then, well, his plan would be in motion, wouldn't it? 
And Jesus, theoretically, would have been arrested before he instituted the Lord's table and before he was able to teach his disciples all that he was going to teach them that night, which actually is contained in the wonderful passage in John 13 through 16. I encourage you to read that. It's a really important passage, because we we won't look at it tonight, uh, because here, in John 13 through 16, Jesus here at the Passover meal with his disciples is his great legacy of promises, not just to them, but to all of us. If you've never read John uh, 13 through 16, you really should. It is such a wonderful encouragement. Here's my challenge to you. Read it this week. Read it as a daily devotional. Read a bit each day. You will be blessed by reading about the promises. So, So Jesus had to celebrate the Passover to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus then had to transition the Passover transform it into the Lord's table, which is the new memorial, which would be for all the redeemed for all the time to come. Jesus had to give them the great legacy of John 13 through 16, though all those massive, sweeping, glorious promises. And also, by the way, he also had to pray the great high priestly prayer, didn't he, in John 17, which is the most staggering prayer in all of Scripture. Again, if you've not read that for a while, read it this week. Because this is where Jesus prays for us. Incredible. So Jesus knew all that needed to happen. Therefore, he could not be arrested until that evening had been completed. He doesn't want anybody to know where all that's going to happen except two people. And he doesn't tell them where it's going to be for fear that somebody might sort of lobby them before they leave. He identifies Peter and John and he tells them to go on a mission of extreme secrecy. Judas can't tell the leaders, the Jewish leaders, because he has no idea where they're going, does he? There's nothing in the text to indicate that Peter and John ever came back. They went early, Thursday. They acquired everything that they needed, and then they went to the place they were told to go, and they spent the day preparing for the meal. And the rest uh, arrived later. Nobody knew where they were going until they actually got there. And once they got there, obviously, well, Judas is stuck, isn't he? He's got to stay there. He can't, you know, he can't pick up his mobile and ring the Jewish leaders, can he? Because they didn't have him then, by the way. Um, but he's stuck, isn't he? Isn't that clever? See, Jesus has a secret plan because there are things he has to accomplish. He will only be betrayed and arrested on his schedule. That's not going to happen until very late Thursday night when he finally finishes everything at the Last Supper. He goes to the Mount of Olives. There he will be arrested and then he will be executed the same day before the sun sets. Only in that little window can he be arrested, tried and executed. Not before, so that he will die, remember, at the very hour all Passover lambs were being slaughtered on the Friday. I mean, it's a stunning thing, isn't it, to see all the details under his absolute control. And that really should encourage us, by the way. You know, sometimes we we doubt God's plans and purposes, don't we? Maybe in this world, maybe in our individual lives. And maybe we think, well, God's just way too busy to worry about all the little details in my life. Well, I think, as we'll carry on, you'll see that every small detail, Jesus is working out. He knows everything. He knows what's going to take place. He orchestrates everything to happen as he wants it to happen. Well, that should encourage us to know that we have a God who is working out his plans and purposes. So that's the first thing. They're the people. They're some of the players that are part of God's plan. The second thing we need to look at is that the Passover is part of God's plan. Very simple outline this evening. The people is part of God's plan. The Passover is part of God's plan. Let's look at it here in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Now, the day of unleavened bread was a seven-day feast. So the day before was called the Passover. It was uh, kind of known as the Passover or the Feast of the Unleavened Bread because it sort of blended together, really. And by the way, really interestingly, Paul beautifully blends them together in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, where he says, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And then in verse 8 he says, Therefore let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. So what Paul is doing, Paul spiritually is connecting those two together. But it is that day, and they must celebrate the Passover. Now let me give you a little bit of information about the Passover. 
the Passover basically commemorated God delivering them, the, the people of Israel, from Egypt, which is recorded back in the book of Exodus. So when the people of Israel were taken captive into Egypt, uh, they, were, they were made slaves in Egypt, as you know, for many generations. Eventually, Moses came, he led them out, the sea parted, drowned Pharaoh's army, they were liberated into the land of Canaan, weren't they? But their liberation preparation came because they were warned by God to cover the doorposts with blood so the angel of death would not kill the firstborn of every house. And they killed a lamb to sprinkle that blood on the doorpost. And then they ate the lamb. They had unleavened bread. They had a Passover feast. That's where it began. And that became a permanent remembrance, really, a memorial to God's deliverance of his people from the land of Egypt. Now, unleavened bread was used then because it was kind of a bread that can ma you can make in a hurry. Uh, you don't have to wait for it to rise, and of course, they had to leave Egypt in a hurry, didn't they? Also, unleavened bread has a kind of sort of spiritual connotation. Leaven in the Bible is used, uh, is always seen as influence, a, a permeating influence such as leaven permeates dough, doesn't it? And usually it's that. That's how it's seen. So unleavened bread then is a symbol of leaving behind all the all the permeating evil influence of Egypt. That's the idea of unleavened bread. And then they were required, according to Exodus 12, to celebrate this every single year on the 14th of Nisan. I don't mean the car dealer. I mean the, the time. The 14th of Nisan, which they had done for generations and generations. A and Jews today still do it as well, don't they? Jesus was going to celebrate this Passover, but here's the thing. This is the last legitimate one. This is the last legitimate one because he transforms it into the Lord's table. He takes the unleavened bread, which once spoke of Egypt. Now it will speak of his body. He takes the wine, which once spoke of deliverance from Egypt. And now he will first, we will refer to it as his blood. And the transformation of that remembrance is over. So no Passover since then is legitimate. The Lord's table is the new symbol. And God does not want us to remember his deliverance in Egypt as the great act. No, he wants us to remember his deliverance at Calvary as the great act. So Jesus must have this night. In spite of the religious leaders and Satan and Judas who are doing their thing, and that's exactly what he will have. So verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John. Now, why Peter and John? Why them? Uh, well, uh, these are the two most uh, intimate ones, aren't they? They are, they are his closest friends, and they are the two leaders, actually. Clearly, in the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 13, Peter and John are the leaders of the early church. And all through these last days, Jesus gives them very special lessons to Peter and John, sort of shaping them and strengthening them, because they will be the leaders of the church when it begins. Now, why just Peter and John and not James? Because you always got the three, didn't you? Wasn't he part of the inner circle? Well, tradition said that only two men could bring a lamb to be sacrificed because if you've got to do sacrifices for hundreds of thousands of people at Passover and you've only got a few hours to do them, you don't want all the people turning up, showing up to this big event of sacrificing the animal. A and so tradition required no more than two could come, which would cut the crowd down significantly. They would bring the animal alive and the priest would kill the animal. He would pour the blood of the animal on the altar. He would keep some of the meat um, that would be for, of the animal, which would be for themselves, for the priest. He offered some to God as a sacrifice, and then the rest of it would be taken by the, the, the people that offered it. Uh, they would take it back to prepare it and to cook it and to use it as the Passover lamb to be eaten by the rest. Now, you've got to remember, at Passover, it would have been an absolute bloodbath, wouldn't it? I mean, you imagine thousands of thousands upon lambs being slaughtered by the priests. And so only two could come. There was only so much space and so much time that they could do this in. So verse 8, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. In other words, take the animal to be slaughtered. But before you even get there, during the earlier part of the day, there's a whole lot of other things that need to be done. So the Passover feast required unleavened bread. Remember, they were nomadic. They were staying at night out on the Mount of Olives, so they didn't have a stock of food somewhere. They had to go find unleavened bread. 
Then they required wine for the Passover, and for the Passover they needed four different symbolic cups of wine that were taken. And I'll talk about that in a moment. They also needed bitter herbs as well, and they needed a dip which was made out of pomegranate and apple and dates, and it was all crushed and blended together with nuts. Some of you are thinking, oh, that tastes really nice. You're getting a bit hungry now. But what they did, that was something in which they dipped the unleavened bread in with their hands. And there were a number of components to the Passover. So let me just go back to those four cups of wine because that was quite significant. They seem to be connected to the sim as symbols to God's promise to his ancient people in Exodus 6, verses 6 to 7. God made these promises. Here they are. He said, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So notice four things. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery. I will also redeem you an outstretched arm with great judgments, and I will be your God. So these four great redemptive promises symbolized in the four cups of wine. The bitter herbs, by the way, they symbolized the bitterness of their time in Egypt. And the dip of apples and dates and pomegranates granites and nuts that were all ground up in a sort of a brown paste. Traditionally, that is thought of symbolizing the bricks that they had to make out of mud. Do you remember that back in when they were under slavery? And they also would use cinnamon sticks, which were included, which reminded them of the sticks of straw that were used in the bricks that were eventually taken away from them, which made the brick making even more challenging, didn't it? Now, all of this had to be prepared. It was all important. It was all symbolic. It was all a reminder, remember, of what was of the great, um, of the way that God had rescued his people. And that to do all of it, that and make sure that they showed up at the right time, three o'clock, for the brief period of a couple of hours and have a priest slaughter their lamb, sprinkle the blood, take some of the meat, bring it back home, roast it and be ready for the evening meal. Do you think Sunday lunch can be a bit challenging trying to get it all ready? Try and do a Passover meal. And by the way, they also had a bowl of salt water at the table to remind them of the tears they shed while they were slaves in Egypt and of the salt waters of the Red Sea, which God wonderfully took them through as he redeemed them. So a lot of preparation by two guys, isn't it? So verse 9, this is the right question, where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. Because they knew of no plans, they knew of no room, no house. I mean... This is a little bit out of character for Jesus, isn't it? I mean, he's usually pretty well organized, isn't he? I mean, he's organized the universe, so that's pretty organized, isn't it? They might have thought to themselves, we could have organized this a little bit better. Plus, we're here because of the Passover. That's why we came. That's why we've made this long trek. Uh, we came down here for the Passover. This is a serious oversight, Lord. Uh, and with the hundreds of thousands of pilgrims who have poured into the city, every available place is surely already taken, Lord. Here we are at this last hour. Just exactly where do you expect us to do all this? But here's the wonderful thing about Jesus knowing all the details. It's not an oversight, is it? They don't know because Jesus doesn't want them to know. But he knows and he's in perfect control of all the plans. So, verse 10, he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, this is getting a bit like a spy story, isn't it? You know, it's like follow the guy in the newspaper under his left arm or something like that. I mean, that's essentially what we're dealing with here. It's very clandestine, isn't it? Follow him to the house that he enters. Now, remember, there will be people pouring into the city because they were going to, who were they going to expect to show up? Well, Jesus. That's why there were more people coming at the Passover time. Here's Jesus. He'd been there every day. He's the greatest show in town. So that place would have been absolutely exploding with people early in the morning. How in the world are we going to find a man with a jug of water? By the way, do you think Jesus knew his name? Of course he did. Jesus knew everything about him. But for the sake of secrecy, Jesus only, identifi only identifies him as a man with a jug of water. That's all they need to know. He'll be there to meet them. Now, was that prearranged by Jesus, or was he supernaturally arranging it? I don't know. Doesn't really matter, does it? 
He could have done it either way, couldn't he? It doesn't say, but look for a man carrying a jug of water. Now, why is that significant? Well, historians tell us that this was not something men did. Hate to say it, ladies, but this was your job. Men were doing much more important things than that. Um, I'm just saying that was the idea at the time. Don't all lynch me on the way out, ladies. Women carried the water. Remember the woman at the well? That's what women did. So, big pot of water on their shoulders. A man carrying a jug of water would, in fact, stand out. Follow that man, Jesus said. Now, remember that Jesus can't say, hey, we're going to go over, to say, to John Mark's house. They're going to get everything ready over there. That's where we're going to meet. He can't do that. Must maintain the secrecy. He must celebrate this evening in complete secret. And Judas sits in that Thursday evening Passover, the Lord's table transformation, listening to all the teaching up to the point where he can't take it any longer. And Jesus finally says, turns to him and he says, you go do it. Now you can betray me. And he sends him out into the night. And later we read that they sing a hymn. They go to the Mount of Olives. They wait for Jesus to be arrested on his time. But Judas is stuck. He's, he's captive, isn't he? He can't get out of the group. He doesn't know where they're going that night. And when he gets there, he can't leave. Jesus knew all about Judas. And he knew he was here for the money. And he knew if he knew the location, he would then betray him there. So follow the man with the water jug into the house that he enters. Verse 11, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? The teacher, well, how many teachers do you think were hanging around Jerusalem at Passover time? Thousands of teachers. This man, when he heard the teacher, we can be pretty sure that this man was a follower of Christ. Had Jesus been to the house? Don't know. If he hadn't been there, he knew it was there anyway, didn't he? Now, I wonder if any of you have spotted something. I wonder if any of you have spotted the problem. Let me show you something interesting. This is Thursday night. Jesus is going to eat the Passover Thursday evening. He's going to be crucified on Friday. The question is, if Jesus is eating the Passover with his disciples on Thursday night, and Passover lambs are slain on Friday, then the Jews couldn't eat Passover till Friday night. So, why is he eating it on Thursday night, and how then is it a legitimate Passover on a Thursday night? Bit of a problem. See, he must die, remember, when Passover lambs are being slaughtered. That's on Friday, and yet he has to have his lambs slaughtered on Thursday to eat the meal on Thursday, so how do we understand this? Discuss. No, I won't do that to you. Well, you see, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that Jesus had the Passover and established the Lord's table on Thursday evening and was crucified on Friday. John's Gospel, on the other hand, says in John 18, 28, Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, the Jews did not enter the palace. Notice, they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So in other words, the Jews, when Jesus was arrested, had not yet eaten their Passover, which means the leaders. So what's going on here then? How could you have a Passover on Thursday night and a Passover on Friday? Here's how to understand it. Go study Josephus. All right, I'll tell you, okay. Or, or, or how about study the Mishnah? Anyone experts on the Mishnah or the Jewish law and other historical sources? If you study it, this is what you find. You find that the Jews in the north and the Jewish people in the south, okay, the Galileans say, as opposed to the Judeans, they had different ways of calculating their days. So in the north, they calculated days from sunrise to sunrise. That was a day. Whereas in the south, they calculated their day from sunset to sunset. So there's a very clear distinction. In Galilee, where Jesus and all the disciples, except Judas, had grown up, they calculated days from sunrise to sunrise. So the 14th of Nisan was sunrise on Thursday to sunrise on Friday. So that puts the Passover Thursday night for the Jews in the south, it was sunset to sunset. So that puts it late Friday for the southern Jews. Same day, calculated two different ways. 
And that worked really well for the Jews. And by the way, the Pharisees tended to go with the northern approach, and the Sadducees, who were all around Jerusalem, tended to go with the southern approach. What that did was really important. And the reason they calculated like this is it, it solved a couple of problems. It split the number of animals to be killed into two different periods. I mean, imagine how many people were needed to be at the temple for the sacrifice. You just couldn't get it done in that length of time, so they needed to split it out. So it, it, they're two different periods, Thursday night, Friday night. And it also, it also reduced what were called regional clashes because the southern people didn't think too highly of northern people. And I'm not talking about in our own country now, I'm talking about at Jewish times. So it was much easier to keep them separated. I won't make any northern and southern jokes because, you know, I'll, I'll annoy half the staff here. But they had to keep the northerners and the southerners separated. Not a bad thing maybe, but we'll discuss that later. So that's what they needed to do. So Jesus is celebrating a Galilean Passover Thursday evening, and that is Friday, the beginning of Friday, sunset, for the Jews who celebrate it late the next day. So the timetable is perfect. Jesus can celebrate the Passover with his disciples on Thursday, and it is in fact a true Passover, and the lambs were slain. And he can still die on the Passover the next night, because there are two times when the Passover lambs are slain. Now, I say all of that because, uh, to me, it just continues to be amazing just how God orders every single detail of this. There's a tiny little window, really, in the sense of all of the history of the whole world. There's this tiny little window from Friday morning when Jesus is arrested in the middle of the night. He goes through all these trials at night, and they go so fast, don't they? And even if the Jews don't want to kill him, what he says so infuriates them that they can't stop themselves from demanding his immediate death. They've got that tiny little window. Arrest him and get him on the cross. And he will literally die at 3 o'clock the next afternoon on Friday. And he will be in the grave before the day is over because he had to be in the grave three days. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He's in control of all of that. And when he died, it was 3 o'clock Friday afternoon. And you can imagine the scene, can't you? Because by that time, the whole land has been dark. God turned out all the light. It's black. <laughs> and they're stumbling and fumbling around in the middle of the day trying to get their sacrifices killed in darkness. Now, that would have been challenging, wouldn't it? Because the darkness that God brought on the world when his son was hanging on the cross. And then he died. And in that moment, the whole city of Jerusalem is hit with a massive earthquake Graves open, people come out of the grave, they're in the temple area. The greatest part of the temple was the Holy of Holies, which was a place in which God de dwelt, separated from his people. The curtain that divides them from God splits from top to bottom and throws open the Holy of Holies to all. You can't even imagine the breathtaking character of that hour when Jesus died. And all the sacrificial system was in full force. But it was all over. The true lamb had died and God was satisfied. How incredible the planning and the detail of God. So Jesus had the Passover, the last ever legitimate Passover, and then he established the Lord's table. And next week, we're going to look at it in detail. And in fact, we're going to spend some time around the Lord's table. We meant to do it tonight, but I bumped it on a week because I think it will be a really special time. Because we'll look at what Jesus does here as he institutes the Lord's table. And then we'll meet around the Lord's table. That's next week. But let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the word of God. We thank you just for Old and New Testament. We thank you that as we've looked at some of the details of the Old Testament sacrificial, as we've looked at sacrificial system, as we've looked at the details of Passover. We thank you for what all that shows us, but it ultimately showed us that there would be the sacrificial lamb, the ultimate sacrifice that would come. And we know that it was Jesus Christ himself. But Father, we are also thankful, we are also so amazed, we are astounded at just how Jesus takes control of every single detail. And Lord, that encourages us 
that encourages us that you know everything. As we've been seeing tonight, we've seen every single detail, every single element of this is being uh, planned and orchestrated by the hand of God. And Lord, that should encourage us because that reminds us too that every single detail of our life is known to you. And therefore your plans and purposes, when we are uh, given our will over to you, your plans and purposes are always right. So we never need to be fearful, we never need to be concerned, because you are at work. You know everything, and we are so thankful. And so, Father, we thank you for what we've learned this evening. Thank you, Lord, that uh, as next week we'll actually think in more detail about the Lord's table, what Jesus instituted there. And then I pray we may have a really special time around the table as we think of the great sacrifice. But thank you, Lord, for what you've shown us tonight about the sacrifice, the Passover. That prepares us to really understand what the Lord's table really stands for. Thank you for what it all means. In Jesus' name, amen.